Hey guys, how you doing? My name is Ben Ferriolo, and as you probably already know, I am an amateur seismologist who hopes to make a career out of what I do right now. I guess I should start making this intro short, since some people in my last video were very peeved and irritated that I have such a long intro. You know, I like to introduce myself to new viewers, but I'm asking you, my regular viewers, is this intro such a problem? And please be entirely truthful in the comment section below. I won't take any offense, guys. My intro here is for people who are new to the channel, who don't know who I am, and for those who already know this stuff, you can always skip it by taking a few seconds to skip forward or just go to the description box below and select the part directly after the intro. Seeing that I always have a parts section in the description box for any video that's longer than 10 minutes. Remember to check my website, a link is of course in the description box below, right under my email address. It contains so much information already, and so many different seismic images for different events that you would be surprised. If you follow my work, then you know the last two major swarms for Yellowstone occurred on December 31st, with 255 earthquakes in about 5 hours and 35 minutes, and the next swarm occurred about a week later on January 6th, with less earthquakes but larger magnitudes. I have continually stated that I believe this signals a massive change for the caldera, and that it could mean a new round of major uplift could be starting again. Regardless of what could happen, it is best to monitor Yellowstone closely. Now some say there's not enough magma down there to cause a super eruption, and you know, they may be right. However, before you bite my head off, know that those people usually are not aware that Yellowstone is a two-chamber system, much like Mount St. Helens and the area around Mount St. Helens. There is a small chamber, albeit still quite freaking large, a conduit, and a large magma reservoir. The reservoir itself is rumored to contain around 11 Grand Canyons worth of magma. Remember, it is the reservoir that contains the majority of the magma, not the chamber itself, but it doesn't take that much to actually feed the chamber. Now again, the shallower chamber does not have as much magma, maybe 15% or so, of the total for the reservoir. However, if magma can feed the chamber from the reservoir to create a small eruption, it could surely create a large super eruption if at all possible. I'm not saying this is going to happen today, guys, but it is entirely possible. I think the majority of the professional's research should not go into the Yellowstone Magma Chamber, but should study the reservoir itself along with the conduit leading to the shallow chamber. Yesterday we saw some interesting events. They were not major by any count, but have not been seen, as far, to, to the best of my knowledge, have not been seen since a decade ago during the 2008-2009 dike intrusion of Yellowstone Lake. In this video, we will check out some data. Remember, if you need help understanding this stuff, you can always go to my website, contact me, or contact a professional. Seismic monitoring of volcanic hazard areas is very simple if you know how to do it, and my website teaches you how to do it. Now guys, I put out a very quick blog post about the recent events at Yellowstone Lake. I also have two separate pages under Yellowstone Supervolcano in the Seismic Events drop-down menu that are dedicated to Yellowstone's recent swarms on December 31st and on January 6th. But this one, I show some of the events that we saw recently at Yellowstone Lake uh, yesterday, I believe it was. Yep, yesterday. Some low-frequency events, guys, that did show many miles away on multiple surrounding seismic stations, so they weren't just ice quakes. And yes, ice quakes from the sheet of ice on top of Yellowstone Lake, yes, that is possible. But these are not ice quakes, trust me. We're going to take a look at that in just a second. But first, I want to take a look at this. This is the helicorder for borehole 208 in the PB network, which resides on the northern tip of Yellowstone Lake. I have sectioned this off. Let's deal with number one and number two first. You can see, it looks like two earthquakes right there, right? With a bunch of little tiny popping throughout the area. Number one is the whole area right here. Number two is these are these earthquakes, excuse me. Number one, the time period of before, during, and after the magnitude 2.4 and other unreported smaller events. You could clearly see the reported earthquake, but what is all of that activity? Now, I first thought they could be very small ice earthquakes caused by the sheet of ice currently covering Yellowstone Lake. However, once the low frequency events occurred, I believe these could be caused by the tiny bubbles of gas farting, quote unquote, its way out of the magma which it lives. 
Remember, some low frequency events that occur during increased unrest are caused by degassing of the magma itself. However, know that there are many other volcanic processes that can create low frequency events, such as magma resonance, like clapping a bell. The earthquakes and the tiny popping during this time period were accompanied by a strange but low increase in sulfur dioxide at Yellowstone Caldera. Could they be related, or could they just be a coincidence? Well, with the events that happened later on, I doubt they were a coincidence. And number two, like I showed you, is these earthquakes. The timeline of the helicopter showing the magnitude 2.4 at 6.4 kilometers in depth. Plots are shown of that. There it is right there, the 2.4 at 6.4 kilometers in depth. We'll take a look at that in just a minute. Number three, this section right here. See these events right there? Number three, this is the time period of the strange low-frequency earthquakes which are almost identical to the one seen during the 2008-2009 dike intrusion of Yellowstone Lake and, to, I should have said to the best of my knowledge, have not been seen since. Notice how on the helicopter above they look almost identical to the higher frequency earthquake. Notice that? See that? They look very similar, right? And with the unaided eye, you'd think that they are the, pretty much the same earthquake. That is another reason why monitoring helicopter charts only will get you nowhere. That is why accurate monitoring of volcanic hazard areas is key. It is also a lot easier than you think. Remember, my website here helps you to do that, blah, blah, blah. Number four is this section right here. Some more popping going on. This section of time will not be included in the plots below for my blog post. They will be examined in the video I will upload tomorrow night, which is the video I'm making right here. During this time period, there were many small high-frequency VT quakes in conjunction with more of those popping low-frequency events. Remember, ice quakes can cause events such as these, but a few of them do show on distant stations, showing some are definitely not being caused by the ice sheet at Yellowstone Lake. So, what the hell is going on? I don't know. So, there is something to watch out for when monitoring the online heli quarters only. Notice how it obviously shows the data stream is missing for many of the Unavco boreholes in the area. Someone monitoring these only would get ticked off. Notice there's a blank spot there, borehole 944. They all have those blank spots. You notice that? Even borehole 950. Go to borehole 208, one of them. And notice there is a blank spot right there. Where'd all the data go? I don't know. However, Look at this. I have the data right here. Let's go back. So we see this. Oh, that's not it. Let's go back. So we see right at 00114. You see that? UTC. Notice that there is a blank area until about 7, right? Let's go to 0014, which is right here. Look at this. I have the data. Notice that none of the charts online have the data at all for this time period, but I do. Why is that? It, remember, the missing data is from right about here to right about here. Notice that? This whole area right there. Why does it show that the data is missing right here? But looky, 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 I have the data right here. It's not missing, guys, at all. That is because it did not connect correctly to the online WebEcorder servers or whatever. So again, I have the same time period. I have the data, but it's missing right here. So why, again, did it not connect to the Webby Quarter online servers? I don't know, but this is another reason why monitoring volcanic and tectonic hazard areas with actual seismic data is way better than just looking at the online heli quarters. Trust me, it's way better and a lot more accurate. Now, I would like to analyze the data for borehole 208, which resides on the northern tip of Yellowstone Lake, some of the data which you see right here. I want to take a look at the activity that was taking place during this time period right here. Remember how I said before all the major low-frequency events appeared, there was magnitude 2.4 with a bunch of other popping right when the new UTC day started for the 13th. Notice how January 13th starts down here for Pacific time because we are behind. Remember how the strange popping and cracking seen on the seismogram started again around the new UTC day. So let's say 0 UTC, January 13th, 2019. Well, check this out. Here we are at earth.noschool.net. Now I have it set to chem SO2 SM. This will show us the sulfur dioxide content at surface level. Notice we are at 21 UTC on the 12th, which is just a few hours before the popping and those few earthquakes occurred. Now right here, 
See this tip right here? That is Yellowstone, right there. Yellowstone Lake is probably right about there, but just know that is Yellowstone right there. So keep your eye right there. All right. So this tiny blob of sulfur dioxide here looks probably about three quarters the size of Yellowstone or so. Let's move time forward and see if we see any stationary plumes of SO2. Of course, you won't see it increase too much, but it did happen. And it doesn't happen all that often in this way, seeing that I monitor this site as well. So let's check this out. Remember, keep your eye right there and let's move forward. Boom, here's the new UTC day. You can see a little dot right there. The popping and the cracking started right now. Boom. There's an, The dot is still there. And then it disappears a little bit and goes away. Now let's see if it reappears. It's kind of hard to tell if it's there or not because there is some background SO2 coming in from some other areas. Let's keep going forward, keep going forward, keep going forward. It looks like there was a little bit of an increase right there at 9 UTC on the 14th. So, yes. There is a tiny, tiny increase in sulfur dioxide. It wasn't that major, but still it happened. Let's go all the way back again before the popping and the cracking started. All the way back. All the way back. All the way back. And, okay, here we are right before the popping and the cracking started. Again, you can see a little dot of SO2. Let's go back a little ways. All right. So it seems to come, let's see, there's a cloud of SO2 a little bit coming from the northeast towards the west, but then it seems to stay right here. I don't think that's because of the wind, though. No, I don't think that is. I believe this is actually coming from Yellowstone. I don't know. Maybe it's not, but still. It's just a weird coincidence that I thought was very odd. Again, the increase in SO2 was not that major, but you can definitely see there was a little bit of an increase right before all this stuff took place that I'm about to show you. So as we saw, there was an interesting increase in sulfur dioxide, but again, it was not major. Was this all just a coincidence? I doubt it. I think Yellowstone was farting during this time period. Just some degassing, but I don't think we have seen this for a long time. Also, the low-frequency earthquakes I'm about to show you are probably caused by degassing as well, but I don't know. They look nearly identical to the 2008-2009 low-frequency events that struck during the infamous dike intrusion that I theorized to be caused by the resonance of magma, clapping an unknown catalyst like a bell. So I don't know exactly what the low-frequency events I'm about to show you were caused by, but to the best of my knowledge, again, they have not occurred at Yellowstone for a decade. Now let's analyze the most recent data for Borehole 208 at the northern tip of Yellowstone Lake. Remember, the stronger low-frequency events during this day were felt on multiple surrounding seismic stations, including YPK, which is pretty far away. So the idea that these could be ice quakes is completely out of the question. Here we are in the seismic program swarm. So we're going to look at the data, borehole 208. Remember the popping I talked about? There's a little tiny increase in sulfur dioxide before this popping started. It's the time period that I stated earlier. Here is January 13th. Now, here is the popping. Let's go to the spectrogram real quick. Notice how they have, some of them have mid-range frequencies, some of them are much lower, more like a low-frequency harmonic tremor, some of them, I'm not saying it is, but look how tiny they are. 40 amplitude count, 60 amplitude count, this one was a little bit larger, 300 amplitude count, that one actually looks like an actual low-frequency earthquake, kind of like the ones that Yellowstone sees. Here is a regular VT earthquake, followed by a strange low-frequency event afterwards. And then there are a bunch of other low-frequency events. A lot of these are very similar throughout the entire day. Well, hundreds of them, but very tiny. I mean, just the tiniest little popping and cracking that could be caused by degassing of the magma chamber, possibly. I don't know. But as we went through the day, some VT quakes appeared. There's one right there. Going to about 500 amplitude count. Not that crazy. But here is the... VT quake that was reported to be a magnitude 2.4 at 6.4 kilometers in depth. Look at how long that tail is, guys. Look at that. And then there's another smaller earthquake right there. And then I believe three. I believe these are three separate earthquakes. One, one, two, three, being bigger than the last. So that happened. Yes, it did. And some more VT quakes did appear throughout the day. 
and we go throughout the day and the popping continues or the degassing, whatever it's caused by. I don't know. This isn't the major thing, though. This isn't the major thing that I wanted to talk about. Let's move forward and see the most interesting, the most interesting part that I want to talk about. Let's scroll down real quick. Do I have just to rescale off? Yes, I do. Okay. First, we are going to look at this. Look at the dominant low frequencies. Again, on my blog post, I showed the plots for all of these events. All of these seven low frequency events right there. Notice dominant frequencies between 1.1 hertz and about 1.9 hertz, making this a low frequency event. Look at that. 400 amplitude count, not that crazy. So when I first saw that, I didn't think too much of it. I was very interested, though, because I haven't seen this type of event since the 2008-2009 diet intrusion of Yellowstone Lake. Here's another event, another low-frequency event that was a little bit stronger, probably going to about 500 amplitude count. And then no more than, let's see, 23, no more than about 10 minutes later or so, boom! There was this one going to about 1,600 amplitude count, I believe. Dominant low frequencies once again. Let's check the spectra. Spectra is showing dominant frequencies between 1.1 hertz and 2.3 hertz, making this a low frequency event. Very similar, very, very similar to the ones that we saw during the dike intrusion of Yellowstone Lake, and I have not seen these since. So these are brand new, guys. Haven't Most likely have not been seen for over a decade, or actually, it'd be exactly a decade. Then there's something in the middle right there, and then boom, another one going to a thousand amplitude counter. So this one was a little bit stranger. Let's go right here. Look at that. What What is causing this, guys? What the heck is causing this? I thought that was very interesting. This one does look a little bit more like an ice earthquake, because ice quakes can cause signals like these. But that doesn't make any sense when this, right here, one of the stronger ones, this one right here, at 2112 UTC, with dominant low frequencies, this one did appear on YPK, which was a station far away from Borehole 208 at Yellowstone Lake, guys. YPK is a good distance away and should not have picked this up if this was an ice quake. Because right here, it, let's say it was an ice quake from the sheet of ice on top of Yellowstone Lake. This is only going to a 1,000 amplitude count. It should have never reached YPK, but it did. Here's another event right here. My goodness, guys, these low frequency events are returning. They are. And then there is a period of calm for a few hours. Then we saw some more VT quakes, some more VT quakes, some more very tiny low frequency events, just like the ones I just showed you. And then let me scroll this down real quick. You can see the popping did start again. I want to show you this earthquake right here. This was a VT quake, a normal volcano tectonic earthquake. But look at what happened right after it. You notice the earthquake right here. And then there's another low frequency event right there, just right after it. Let's zoom in on that real quick. Look at that, guys. Almost near perfect waveform oscillations. Look at that. And then some other very tiny, very, very tiny low frequency events throughout the day. Very tiny, more popping or degassing. I don't know what it could be caused by. Remember, I first thought that a lot of these are ice quakes, but since it coincided with a little increase in SO2 and also these stronger low-frequency events, I believe this is definitely something seismic, especially since this, this one right here cannot be an ice quake, again, because it showed up miles and miles and miles away and had a low amplitude right near the epicenter. So again, and here's another VT quake. Another VT quake. There were a few more. Some more popping, some more degassing, or whatever. But yes, we do have an increase in low frequency events at Yellowstone Lake. Uh, yeah, and I thought that was very interesting. But let me show you this. I, I want to show you something that you could do yourself if you want. Let's find a good one. Let's say, let's use this one real quick. And let's go to my website real fast. Here's Yellowstone Lake. Okay, seismic events, drop down menu. Go to 2008-2009 Yellowstone Lake. And it'll open this up. Okay, let's scroll all the way down to... Where is it? Low-frequency earthquakes, possibly indicative of strong magma resonance. All right, I know the window frame isn't big enough, but I think you can see... Let me skip forward to... One of the more prevalent ones. Of course, these are much stronger, guys. Guys, these are much, much stronger than the ones that we saw today and yesterday at Yellowstone Lake. But still, 
the characteristics of the waveforms. Pay attention to the waveforms. Look at that. Notice how similar they look to this right here. Let me zoom in just a little bit. Keep this in mind. Keep these waveforms in mind. The near-perfect waveform oscillations. Look at that. Keep those in mind, guys. Especially this one. Look at that. All right, let's go back. Let's go here. And these events might look a tiny bit different because, because this data is taken from LKWY. Look at that. They look very, very similar, don't they? Except these ones had a little bit more higher frequencies at the beginning. Look at that. Let's scroll down to the next section for these events. Remember, keep those waveforms in mind, guys. They look very similar, don't they? Those are some hybrid events. Yeah, very similar. They're not exact, but again, very similar and have not been seen at Yellowstone since the 2008-2009 dike intrusion, guys. So could another intrusion of magma be occurring? Could that be what is causing all of this tiny, tiny popping? Because remember, let's say an intrusion of magma occurs in the same location that it did, 2008-2009. If the same amount of magma tries to intrude in that same area, because let, let's not say that it's a more magma, let's just say it's the same amount. The earthquake swarm will not be as prevalent with strong earthquakes, with strong VT earthquakes. But I think, since the weak spot is already there, there would be more low-frequency earthquakes and smaller VT quakes, unless there's more magma trying to come in to do whatever. You know what I'm trying to say? Because remember, during the 2008-2009 dike intrusion of Yellowstone Lake, there was a magnitude 4.6 earthquake, which the professionals stated had a 50% tensile crack opening source, or something like that, which means it was an explosive earthquake. Just right under the surface of Yellowstone Lake, just right under there, there was an explosion. Magnitude 4.6 explosion, they already stated that in the publication. I'll leave a link to their publication in the description box below. So that means there is a weak spot in this area, guys. Let's turn on the spectrogram real quick. Some of the recent data is showing some more VT quakes. Rapid succession, rapid fire swarm, a little bit of swarming, multiple events. Kind of like what we see at West Thumb Lake sometimes. High frequencies, not seeing very many low fr Oh, here's another low frequency event. Very, 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 very tiny. Only 200 amplitude count. And some more rapid fire VT earthquakes. Again, another low frequency event, very tiny. Okay, and then we have this earthquake here, which almost looks like a hybrid event. I don't know. So, guys, wasn't that interesting? Let's go back. Again, I am pretty fascinated that these have been seen, once again, and have not been seen since the 2008-2009 dike intrusion of Yellowstone Lake. Oh, by the way, before most of these occurred, just before, look at this. I'm going to zoom out a little bit and zoom in on this. Oh, zoom out and zoom in. <laughs> Look at that. What the hell is that, guys? What the hell? I thought this was a teleseism at first, but I was not able to pinpoint any earthquakes in the world during this time period that can account for this. I thought it was a teleseism, which is a global distant earthquake, larger than usually 5.0. I thought it was because dominant low frequencies between 0 0.5 hertz and 1.1 hertz and then another dominant range of 1.2 to 2.0. So it's a little too low. 0 0.5 is pretty low for it to be actually volcanic or harmonic tremor. So I thought that was strange. So I thought it was a global earthquake, right? Well, there were no global earthquakes that could have accounted for this signal, which I thought was very, very peculiar. So I actually don't know what this signal is. It's an unknown signal, guys. Very weak, though. Look how weak it is. 30 amplitude count. That's, like, barely even mentionable. But it did happen. And to me, it kind of looks like some type of tremor, guys. Some type of low-frequency tremor, but the frequencies, again, are way too low. Usually, harmonic and volcanic tremor occur between, like, 0 0.9 hertz to 3 hertz. Barely going beyond 5 hertz. I don't know. So, we'll just have to wait and see. Now, I'm going to go back real quick. I'm going to close out of this. I want to see the most recent data. I have not looked at it yet this morning, so we're going to look at it together. So the 14th at 1700, I'm just going to put that like that because we already looked at all of the data prior to that. To the 15th at 1700, it's not even close to the 17, uh, to 1700 on the 15th, but we're just going to do that just to top it all off. Borehole 208, PB, EHZ. I'm going to scroll down, and we're going to click this link, and it's going to download the data. Is it going to download? 
It's going to be slow. Okay, it downloaded. All right, let's go back to the program swarm real quick. And we will open the most recent file that I downloaded, which is right here. Okay. Now, as of 1.31 p.m. Pacific Time, January 14th, 2019, this is the most recent data. And looky, looky, looky. What do we have here? Notice how the low frequency popping that we saw earlier is really not even here. You can't even see it. It's not even happening. But it has been replaced by these larger low frequency events. Let me pan this up real fast. Okay, that's very tiny, not even worth mentioning. But let's go forward. Let's see what we see, shall we? Wow, okay, what is this? Now, this actually really does look like an ice quake, guys. This really does. I mean, the P wave, I'm not even, it doesn't even look like it traveled underground. It could have, I don't know. To me, this does look like an ice quake, but this looks totally different than the other strong low frequency events that I showed. This one, however, what the heck is this, guys? Look at this. What? That's not even an ice quake or an ice tremor or anything. That's just weirdness. Let's look at the dominant frequencies, shall we? Dominant frequencies, just like the low frequency events we saw 2008, 2009. Dominant frequencies are usually between 1.4 hertz and 2.2 hertz or so. Okay, well, what is going on at Yellowstone, guys? We already know that on December 31st, 2018, on right when New Year's Eve was starting for the new UTC day, that a large swarm appeared. 255 earthquakes just west of the northern tip of Yellowstone Lake, almost directly between station YML and borehole 208. Um, and then just about a week later, there was a smaller quantity swarm, yes, but it had much larger magnitudes in such rapid succession, I thought it was very strange in a strange, odd location just south of Amethyst Mountain outside of the Caldera Boundary, which I thought was very interesting. Let's look at some more of these recent events that have been occurring, and look at this. Almost to 2,000 amplitude. I'm going to say probably 1,800 amplitude count. And this one is strange because it's emergent. Notice that? Let's check this out. Look at that. Let's look right at the beginning. I don't even know, guys. I'm thinking this is definitely being caused by degassing. I do not think that these are being caused by magma resonance like I thought during the 2008-2009 dike intrusion. They could be caused by that. I don't know. But this is definitely not just ice events, guys. Because there is a pretty thick sheet of ice on top of Yellowstone Lake right now. But the thing is, I they cannot create signals like these that can travel hundreds of miles. Because a few of these that go to almost 2,000 amplitude count do travel about 100 miles. And they shouldn't, guys, if they really are coming from the ice sheet. They should not act like that. Look at this. Look at these low-frequency events, guys. This one is not as strong, only, whoops, sorry, only going to about 600 amplitude count, not that strong at all. Not even close to what, uh, how strong we saw the ones uh, during the 2008-2009 intrusion, again. Dominant frequencies are different this time. Dominant frequencies are between 3.2 hertz and 1.4 hertz, a little bit higher, just a little bit, still considered a low frequency event. Again, notice how the weaker frequencies don't even go past 9 hertz at all, but the strong frequencies don't even go past 4 hertz. This is a low frequency event, typical low frequency event, regardless of what it's caused by. It's still low frequency. That's going to 100 amplitude count, very tiny. That's going to about 100 amplitude count, very tiny as well. Let's check the dominant frequencies of that between 1 hertz and 2.2 hertz. So, more low frequency events, guys. A Yellowstone Lake as of 1.35 p.m. Pacific Time, January 14th, 2019. Let's keep going forward. Keep going forward. Whoa, hello there, buddy. What is this? 200 amplitude count. Another low frequency event looking more like a tremor event. Definitely not an ice quake. Definitely not an ice tremor, guys. Let's go back. Spectrogram. Now remember guys, again, this is the most recent data as of me recording this video. Of course, this video probably won't be uploaded until tonight, but still. Two events right here within about, I'm going to say, 20 seconds or so. Look at that. Yep, definitely not a nice event, guys. Look at that P-wave right, yeah, okay. 
That's really occurring. What is causing this? I think since there was a small increase in sulfur dioxide, very tiny though, it was very small, but still, I think it is being caused by the degassing of the magma chamber somehow. I don't know in what way, because guys, I'm still a beginner at all this stuff. I still have a crazy amount to learn, and there's still a lot that I don't understand. But I'm trying to do my best to explain some of this, and to even understand some of this. Because I do have a uh, very basic understanding of how seismic waves travel through the ground versus travel on the surface. They do look different on the waveforms. You can tell the difference. This right here does not look like a low-frequency uh, low earthquake or tremor, but it might be. 0 0.9 hertz to 1.7 hertz. Okay, I thought that was going to be much lower because this looks like a teleseism. This looks just like a global large earthquake to me. Typical of it, but I, I don't know. That might not be. That might, I don't know. Okay, but real quick, I wanted to tell you that some of these events right here, and especially during the 2008-2009 event at Yellowstone Lake, they have almost near-perfect waveform oscillations. That means the spacings from, let's say, right here to right here to right here to right here would be perfect. So harmonic tremor is named that because the waveform spacings made it look like music because the waveform spacings were almost perfect, almost perfectly spaced apart. That's why I call these strange, strange, like right here, look, see, starting from right here to right here, it looks almost perfectly spaced, doesn't it? I think that I am going to name some of these low-frequency events with near-perfect waveform oscillations. I'm going to name them harmonic earthquakes because they do happen at other volcanoes worldwide, but they're usually just labeled low-frequency earthquakes. But what does that technically mean? I think harmonic earthquake would be a better term to use to signify the near-perfect waveform oscillations of any given earthquake. It doesn't even have to be a low-frequency earthquake. If the, if the waveform oscillations are near-perfect, then I consider it a harmonic earthquake. This one's very... Whoa. Okay. This is the first time I'm seeing this. Do you see this? Look, it builds. It starts right here. Builds and builds and builds and build boom. And what is that? Look at this, guys. My goodness. Look at these waveforms. Definitely not ice, guys. This was definitely a low-frequency earthquake, going to about 600 amplitude count max. Look at that. Wow, dude. My goodness. And a stronger one going to about 1,000 amplitude count. Typical low-frequency possible harmonic earthquake. Remember, that's my new term. From right here to right here. Look at this. Almost perfectly spaced. You notice that? Again, harmonic characteristics. So, what is going on at Yellowstone, guys? What Really, why is everything changing all of a sudden? It's just getting weird. It's just getting really, really weird for me. Let's go through them once again just with the spectrogram. There's one right there. Typical low frequencies. Remember this one built and built and built and boom. And there's another one. There's two right there. Remember, all of these low frequency events are unreported. They have not been reported yet. I think another swarm is approaching. I mean, of course, it is swarming a little bit with low frequency earthquakes. But I believe a much larger swarm is approaching for Yellowstone Lake. I don't know when it would happen, but that's just my take on all this. So, that was extremely interesting, huh? And it looks like this activity is just beginning. Now, why are these low-frequency events returning all of a sudden? Could they be related to the degassing of the magma chamber? Or is it magma resonance itself or some other volcanic process? I don't know, but all I do know is that it has not really been seen at Yellowstone for over a decade. Or actually, it'd be exactly a decade, pretty much. I personally believe a brand new uplift sequence is beginning. We will have to wait and see, but it doesn't look like seismicity at Yellowstone is stopping. You know, it is so sad that just by looking at the earthquake reporting websites, you would think Yellowstone is as quiet as can be, even with the multiple swarms recently. However, these low-frequency events still have not been reported, even though they showed on multiple surrounding stations quite a distance away.
Also, many of the recent swarms have been underreported like crazy. For swarms at Yellowstone, especially rapid fire swarms, they usually only, re only report, excuse me, about 10% of the earthquakes that actually occurred, giving a dramatic idea that seismicity was much lower than it actually was. I wish University of Utah did not do this. You should always try to report every single event, no matter how small, no matter how closely spaced. Just do your best. Of course, some events can be too small to be located, but they should be able to accurately locate 50 to 70% of the swarms, or excuse me, of the earthquakes and the swarms that occur. Oh well. Sorry, guys, I had to vent a little. <laughs> you know, I would love to visit Yellowstone right now, but I live so far away. I live in Bothell, Washington, and Yellowstone is like 860 miles or so to my east-southeast. Have you been to Yellowstone before? Please tell me your experiences in the comments section below. I would love to visit one of the most dangerous supervolcanoes in the world. And I have specific areas of Yellowstone that I would love to check out that most people probably don't even care about. I think it is funny when people say, I don't see a volcano anywhere. I then tell them, hey guys, you're standing in it. The reason you cannot see the Yellowstone volcano when you are there is simply because it is vastly too large to comprehend with the human eye. Well, you know, unless you're in an airplane. I think the call there is what, like 55 miles wide by 35 miles north to south or something like that. Let me know if I'm wrong about that. So it is pretty large and I think you can fit the city of Tokyo, the largest city in the world, in the caldera. I hope you guys all had a great day today, and I will be back soon. Keep an eye on Yellowstone, and I will update you if anything more changes, and please remember to monitor my website. I do put a lot of my information, a lot of my plots on my website under multiple pages, under my Seismo blog, the two seismic events pages, and many other areas, so make sure you check out all the pages. God bless, guys, and be safe. Remember, the truth is considered hate or fear to those who hate or fear the truth. Ben Ferriolo, signing off. See you later, guys.